Hello everybody and thank you for joining. This is your host Nino and I am obliging on the request that I do more old Lisp and AI books. This followed after my last book review and I actually decided that this is certainly a fun endeavor and let's just start right away with a classic. The Lisp 1.5 Programmer's Manual from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology created by John McCarthy at Ali in 1962. So you can say that this is as close to original Lisp as it is reasonable, reasonably possible. So this is August 1962, right? Well, and this book is ex exceedingly famous, but not very thick. In fact, it's under 100 pages, 99 actually, haha. And it has a quite interesting focus in that it doesn't actually care about the reader being gently introduced to anything at all. It quite pushes you into things, into a concise manner, more like a sort of technical theoretical manual, somewhere switching between mathematics, technical implementation, and a little bit of practical how-to, but not all that much. So it's not good as an introductory book, to be quite frank, but it certainly is interesting to give you background of the depths of Lisp, particularly in its early stages. And Therefore, the treatment of Lisp in this book is, compared to many other books, strangely formal. On the other hand, not very deep and exhaustive, but, but just telling you enough that you could figure out perhaps the rest if you were to think about it carefully yourself. So, let's just jump straight into it. It starts with the expression of the atomic symbol, which frankly, I find very funny. Because, you know, it was the 60s, everything had to be atomic. I mean, of course it does suit it from ancient Greek, atomos, undivisible, and this is not a list, uh, a list itself, but like a thing. But on the other hand, a little bit ironic, because they started to tack things onto the atom. I'm talking here of property lists, for instance. So... <laughs> I always will keep finding that a funny name, but they do state something interesting from the beginning on that S expressions actually greatly aid the programmer in composing complex structures without having to bother that much how they are physically organized inside the machines. What they then, however, venture to do is to express S expressions and M expressions and differentiate them, whereby S expressions is what you're used to seeing and M expressions is the language for defining functions working on S expressions. And it's essentially the same thing, basically, just that the functor argument is outside, then the function is within square brackets and the separator between symbols is the semicolon. At the time, actually, it was more common for that to be either the um, space or the comma, but not, not the semicolon. So it looks a bit like a, a somewhat artificial notation just in order to differentiate data from function definitions and function applications, which somewhat goes against the very idea of homo iconicity, which Lisp is so famous for, namely that Lisp programs look like Lisp data. And in fact, the Lisp programs do look like the Lisp data pretty much here already, but in the mathematical description before that, so to say, they so much insist on using these M expressions so far as to even demand you to translate later M expressions into S expressions when you actually want to use the thing. As I say, I don't find that very necessary or advisable as an approach, but in some cases, for instance, there's a nice explanation of how 
lambda function application works, it might be useful to have a look at that too in order to understand how things were structured. So what they already show you early on over here, for instance, is that you can apply functions on functions, right? And that the car of a symbol itself is undefined. They even later on warn you that it may um, create garbage output and things like that. Well, as we advance, you, you can actually see here a very nice function definition of third as the car of the CDR of the CDR. All right, so they show you that. And yeah, they already introduce conditionals, in particular starting with the famous ek. Okay, but the fun thing is that they immediately connect the conditionals to recursive function definitions. In fact, they tell you that that's the very purpose of using conditionals. The main application of conditional expressions is in defining functions recursively. So you're being pushed straight into the cold water already on page six into recursive function definitions. This is not like a gentle introduction to symbolic computation. This is more like, uh, <laughs> that's life, man, get used to it. <laughs> so, so they go there, explain you a greatest common divisor algorithm and, and just go, go straight into using recursions in Lisp. Which, of course, was something exceptional at the time when you were having such Fortran, which was not able to do a recursion. So that was quite an achievement at the time, right? Now, what's also interesting is that they tell you that lambda notation alone is inadequate for naming recursive functions. Like, great that you define it, but what, what, how do you refer to it, right? So they introduce here the label facility, which is something like a let for functions. And they explain you how that can be used in order to name functions so that you can use them afterwards in, uh, in defining a recur a recursive functions. And they have it here for the equal definition. They also go a little bit into explaining to you how to translate M expressions into S expressions, where one might indeed wonder why they didn't just go for S expressions to begin with. But that is certainly something which comes later, though not much later. I have a book from about a couple of years later only, and there they have already quite ditched M expressions in favor of S expressions. So that was quite early recognized that you can perhaps do away with this part entirely. <laughs> so dividing that much programs and data didn't turn out to be the path for scheme, right? Okay, fun thing is, although they explained to you label quite early on, they only a couple of pages later, I'll show you, already tell you that you don't have to use it. <laughs> um, it's interesting that they already show you a couple of recursive definitions, such as append and member, right? But they are shown in this weird notation and not in the way you would normally expect to see them, let's say, in more modern Lisp books. What's interesting is that they then go, yeah, here you have further of this. They explain you also a little bit about A lists and P lists, right? Uh, they, they will do that later on uh, a little more in depth to explain about them. Here you're having an ASOC, so you can see that. But they hang a little bit in the air. Uh, what's interesting is that they go very quickly for, uh, for set functions member union and intersection. Now, while these are common to see in Lisp, and also in common Lisp, uh, <laughs> it is interesting that many other books do not actually pay attention to them as much, but given the somewhat mathematical focus of this book, it is perhaps, um, 
perhaps useful for them to, to go for that so, so quickly. And I again show you here the definitions recursively in this M expression notation, which you can lo look at as a sort of intellectual exercise, but not particularly useful. What is interesting here is though that they introduce define. And just afterwards, they actually tell you, yeah, I just afterwards tell you that nobody is actually using define uh, label and that define is replacing it. And they are telling you that label works with the A lists of, uh, of a symbol, whereas define is using the P list, which somewhat hangs in the air here. And they do not ever actually explain you exactly what that is, uh, like why that exists. And the define therefore overrides a label because the P list is found before the A list. If you allow me here a personal note, this comes from IPL 4 and 5, which were list processing assembler languages used before Lisp and which were, compared to Lisp, straight clumsy. But they were used to implement a famous early artificial intelligence program, namely the General Program Solver which does things that nowadays one gets to do in introductory chapters in Prolog, uh, namely pathfinding from problem to solution. That, that's pretty much what the general problem solver is doing. And it was impl implemented in IPL and from there comes the study in particular with the P-lists. <coughs> what was interesting was that the lists in IPL could be only flat like you couldn't have lists of lists, you could have lists of atoms and that's it. Well, going on further, <laughs> I love, you know, after all of this um, formalisms, they are telling you over here that you can write lambda x of car x and use that, but it would be much more convenient to write car. Oh, really? After everything you've done so far, you go for convenience. All right, <laughs> I'll remember that. Then they are telling you already that they are done. Uh, that's interesting, actually. They are telling you that this is what, what Lisp is, like what pure Lisp is about. And the, here you have also this a formal mapping of M expressions into S expressions, what we don't do anymore, actually. And that they will now go into the practical details of handling, and not, uh, handling Lisp on an IBM 1790 computer. <laughs> I love that. I do admit. And then again starts this funny story with truth and falsity, T and F and maybe Neil and maybe T with um, asterisks around it, you'll see in a moment. Where they go into this, this, this somewhat strange discussion over here and this, this page and the next. So basically they're telling you that you're supposed to be using F and T and not to quote them, but that they will result in T with um, surrounding asterisks and F will result in nil. And it's fun because later on, common list completely ditched the asterisks and we're just, it's just using T to evaluate to T. And the F was apparently dropped in favor of Neil, whereas Scheme has gone back to using T and F. Again, showing that perhaps Scheme is keeping a little bit more in the original spirit of, um, of this setup. All right, and that's, that's pretty much it with here. Then it goes on to explain you a little bit about the numbers. And you can have negative uh, exponents in this system because in some systems you couldn't, but that looks not so bad. And what is here to be noted too, as elsewhere, is this strange early focus on octal, right? That, that's an interesting thing about Lisp in general, that, uh, that it allows you to handle numbers in a lot of different bases quite naturally and one might at least assume that it may have come from the idea of using octal early on and thereby needing to handle more than just the decimal base 
from the beginning. Octal numbers are here with Q, and now follows a classical example of a factorial function. There you go, using defun, define, not with this super weirdo uh, <laughs> uh, notation that, that they otherwise use. I mean, yes, they have it, but you, you also get to see it in, in a normal Lisp way. And then they also show you all the various mathematical functions, right? I must say this, this was not a bad equipment. What's also interesting is that they were using things like, you know, difference minus times add, is that over here? No, plus, it's plus, yeah. So, and also add one, which is like ink and deck, you know, and sub one is like deck for assembly. So these are functions which, which propagate later on and you continue to see them, including in modern Lisp. And then you're having here these predicates of greater p and less p and zero p and one p and so on. Yeah. So one well, can say the mathematical equipment of this thing was not so bad at all, if if it wasn't sheer speed that you were going for. And what's interesting is that you are having a rather clumsy array feature over there. But to be quite frank, I find the modern Lisps at a feature with the set of the RF quite clumsy as well. So this isn't actually worse than what we're having nowadays, in my opinion. And then comes the revenge of the clumsiness. <laughs> uh, they are showing you the prog feature, namely if you would like to write algol-like programs. Hmm? That, that's what they call imperative programming. That's a term they continue to use throughout like also in other list books. And what you're doing there, they are showing you already the main ingredients. You're using a prog. You're having a go-to. So this, is, this is like a go-to go thing. And when you're done, you return. That's pretty much how you would do it nowadays anyway with all sorts of lists that you're having. Nowadays in common list, you still have tag body go, so you can do something substantially similar. And uh, interesting is that these here, these, these are the variables that you use later on. These had to be named. If you were to use none, then this should be an empty list, as they are telling you in the following um, page. And, and they are introducing set coup, which is uh, like set, but with a quote. Yeah, they, they explain that a little bit further over here. All right, then what did I want to show you here? Yeah, they also had a tracing facility. Now, that's interesting because tracing is already introduced as something to debug recursive functions. So this algo-like nonsense <laughs> that you saw previously was not something where they were putting all that much focus on. You could apparently here just, you know, print your, your way around and show what is having what value. But for recursive functions, because they were so important to the whole concept here, they did introduce the trace facility, which is showing you basically the intermediate recursive function calls already then in this early Lisp system. Well, then comes a little bit of traditional treatment of Lists, lists, lists as boxes in memory. Now, I think maybe barely or no this book can can survive without doing that. So they are showing you eventually what this looks like in memory, but they do not dwell on it for quite so long. I must say I find that good because some books really spend like like a couple dozen pages on that, which I find complete nonsense. Well, then again, thirty nine. There is this somewhat stepmotherly, or how do you call it, negligent treatment of property less lists. And again, they're just, just not telling you why this is there and that it comes from IPL4 and 5 or thing, things like that. Just tells you that every atomic symbol has a property list. But why? <laughs> it doesn't have to have a property list, right? But it does have one. <laughs> so... Like you could solve the things which you are using them for differently, but okay, here it was used that way. We we take it as as existing, right? 
Now, they are introducing then later air placa and air placa de. These ones where you're setting basically the, the car the car and the cadre of um, of pairs to something else. And they do warn you that you can create circular lists, which are going to create issues with printing and, and equal operation and substitution. Basically anything which crawls along a list, which when it encounters a circular list will treat it as infinite. And... Then comes something which really you, you can see which sort of guys has created that book, namely an example, a complete list program, the Wang algorithm for the propositional calculus. Now I'm saying that with full respect for the authors, but this is the least practical example of Lisp I have ever seen in any Lisp book. You know, <laughs> like, dear reader, in case you want to do some meta computation about propositional calculus, we have here an algorithm to do that. What you, however, can profit from is that on page 48 and 49, they do show you how this is implemented, actually very nicely. Here's the define, which is beginning a list of function definitions. So this is why I do not get a define per function, but you're getting one define defining all the functions. And you can get a clear idea of how this was actually made to, to work. What is interesting is that these are basically all the cursive definitions. You do not actually have here any progs, you know, that this is they try to keep it theoretically pure, and yeah, they have here this ridiculous M language uh, expression. <laughs> so they keep it here quite pure. For anybody who doubts whether Lisp, uh, whether Lisp was devised to be a functional language, yes, it was. And what is further noteworthy is, although this thing has print and no sprint, it doesn't use it. Yeah, it just defines the functions, you use them, and then output is given as a functional result. They do not actually read and print things, which might be understandable given that this was actually um, a punch card system. You know, if you were going for the IBM 1790, you were going to use punch cards. So, uh, yeah, that, that that's basically how a Lisp um, function definition looks like. Okay, and then maybe the program output is a little bit interesting because they can show you here what this true value looks like. Here you have it. True is T between asterisks. <laughs> they have not yet divide, de decided that T shall simply be T. Now then come on 56 to 69 some machine language details and uh, function definitions in the M expression form. There you have it. That's I find that not too interesting, but you do get to see what functions are available. So perhaps for, as a list of functions that that chapter is perhaps useful, right? Like as a sort of dictionary, you know? So you're having here all of this. Uh, yeah, and there's this. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> Okay, so you're having here just just this list of functions, nothing, nothing too fancy, but you can see that there are a lot, right? And you already have stuff like nconc. And there was something funny though. Yeah, here. You're having in the map functions no map car. Like in in scheme, you could say you, you have mainly map car <laughs> because that's what mapping is doing there. And in common Lisp, you're having all sorts of mapping functions. So here the story started, but hasn't been all that much extended yet. And then when we go to page 70, yeah, we're having here this very famous Appendix B. This is perhaps the most famous part of the book. Uh, this is showing you how the core of a Lisp evaluation system can be um, can be defined. So this is perhaps 
the part which is showing you lisp in its baddest bones you know the evaluator now they themselves say that of course they go for practicality and not just for such theoretical pureness but it's nonetheless nice to see it now you have <laughs> and then you're having yeah one funny thing you know they don't call it a REPL the read evil print loop they rather call their system the lisp overlord and they have dedicated where is it yes an entire chapter on the overlord i am voting for calling modern lisp repls the overlord <laughs> what does your lisp overlord say oh the result is such and such <laughs> mm. now what's interesting here is that here way behind everything like like you know we, we have passed everything we're just somewhere in the appendices they are finally defining the reading and printing thing and in particular you also have a punch right because this is an ibm 7090 and um terpri was meaning somewhat different things than it does nowadays it prints what is left in the buffer and then clears it that's not the same as a carriage return uh, <laughs> you did have print one already you had print you had read you had punch which we lack nowadays though i am very much for introducing punch i do believe our our modern computers need a little bit of punch cards just for the flair but they didn't really all that much care about it which i understand because they didn't really work at the REPL in our more common sense they were working at an overlord to which they were supplying lisp packets that's what they were calling it so it's not exactly the way we are used to seeing things and then things are pretty much ending with just maybe two things to note yeah you're having here a recursion and a push down list basically they go here for garbage collection they explain you that like how, how this is working that that you're having recursive calls and that evidently you need to clean up everything and that functions are being ma marked as like uh, as active in the memory and when they are not anymore active then they can be garbage collected after they have been pushed onto something which we would call um pretty much a stack nowadays i would estimate so that's what they call a uh, push down list and the last thing i wanted to note is was how little people were working back in the day see they give you here what you will get after you are um like setting up their lisp system and what i see here is that as free storage you're having some 22,400 octal which is around 10k cells decimal and if i interpret that correctly which i might not because i might have overlooked something that would be like a really small system right <laughs> with 10k cells free for for you but nonetheless i do find that a very ingenious achievement for the time and i'm surprised actually i was surprised the first time i read this how quite complete and not just theoretically experimental the entire thing already was in 1962 and that concludes it yeah page 99 just as i promised you in the beginning the rest is just some you know um dictionary and and, and things like that but it's nothing relevant anymore all right so that is lisp 1.5 programmer's manual I hope you enjoyed it. More books are to be reviewed in the future. So I hope you'll become a regular guest. I hope to greet you here soon again. I wish you a wonderful day. And from me, goodbye.